the most dangerous sea captain in the history of the world. If there was a naval commander as great or maybe even better than Nelson or Sir Francis Drake, then you'd have heard of them, wouldn't you? If there were statues of him and streets named after him around the world, his name would trip off the tongue, shouldn't it? Hands up if you've heard of Thomas Cochran, 10th Earl of Dundonald and Marquess of Maranhao. Not many. Yet this man inspired the Horatio Hornblower series of books, was nicknamed the Sea Wolf by Napoleon himself and El Diablo by Spanish sailors. His daring bravery during the French Revolutionary Wars sounded like a Hollywood action movie. On top of that, he was also a liberation fighter in South America and an inventor. Thomas Cochran's life was one roller coaster adventure after another. Noble and Naval Family Cochran was born into Scottish nobility in 1775. There was a history of military service on both sides of his family. When he was five, his uncle came up with the idea of listing him as a crew member on Royal Navy ships. Now, don't worry, he wasn't actually working on the ship itself. This was done so it appeared he'd done many years of service needed for promotion before he'd even signed up. It sounds like cheating, doesn't it? Well, it was, and its official name was False Muster. Although illegal, a lot of people did it. Funnily enough, this was exactly the kind of practice that Cochran would campaign against in later life. When still very young, his father secured him a commission in the army, but he hated it. He knew it wasn't for him and begged to be released, which he was. When 17, he joined the Navy as a midshipman at the outbreak of the French Revolutionary Wars. This was an officer's position thanks to his name being on the rosters for so many years. He quickly discovered that this was the life for him. He loved the life on the sea and the thrill of battle. There was just one problem. He was always arguing and talking back. It didn't matter if it was someone of a lower rank or an admiral. If he thought there was a better way of doing something, he spoke out and didn't care if it was going to hurt his career or not. All the same, within three years he became a lieutenant and in 1800 was given command of his majesty's ship, the Speedy. Where legends are born. Speedy was small, and below deck, Cochrane had to stoop. The top brass knew they had to reward this gifted sailor, but the small ship was also a bit of a slap on the wrist for talking back to his superiors and wanting to change things. They may have thought giving him this ship with 14 puny four-pounder cannon would teach him a lesson, but the lesson was definitely taught by him. His achievements with Speedy are the stuff of legend. In 1800, a Spanish warship was disguised as a merchant ship and nearly captured him. He escaped by flying a Danish flag and convincing the enemy ship that they had the plague on board. He kept a collection of flags and used them regularly for the rest of his career to fool the enemy. On another occasion, he was being chased by an enemy frigate and knew it could follow them in the night due to the lights on the ship. So Cochrane released a barrel with a lamp in it into the sea. The enemy followed that instead of them and Speedy escaped. If you remember Russell Crowe doing something similar on Master and Commander, it's because Captain Jack Aubrey was based on him. David and Goliath One of the most daring naval stories ever was Cochrane's capture of the Spanish frigate El Gamo with its 32 guns and 319 men. Cochrane's ship was outgunned and tiny compared to El Gamo but at no point did he think he couldn't defeat it. Up to his old tricks, Cochrane flew the American flag and managed to get so close to the frigate that the Spanish couldn't aid in their large cannon at Speedy's hull. Every time they fired, they just made holes in the smaller ship's rigging or sails. Speedy, in the meantime, with its 14 guns and 54 men, could use its pathetically weak guns to aim directly into Agamo's hull and cause some real damage. The Spanish only had one option, they would have to board Speedy, but Cochrane teased them mercilessly. When the Spanish went to their guns, Speedy came up very close and fired. When they left their guns to board, Cochrane quickly pulled away so the Spanish were always out of reach. Finally, the game of cat and mouse came to an end when Cochrane and crew boarded El Gamo and seized the ship despite being outnumbered 6 to 1. In Speedy's 13-month cruise, he captured, burned, or drove ashore 53 ships before three French ships under Admiral Charles-André Linois captured him on 3rd July, 1801. While Cochrane was being held a prisoner, Linois often asked him for advice. 
In his autobiography, Cochrane wrote how courteous and polite the French officer had been. A few days later, he was exchanged for the captain of another French ship. On his return to Britain, he was promoted to the rank of post captain. Cochrane should have been given every medal going, but because he spoke out when he saw his superiors being incompetent, the stuffy establishment, who didn't want him to rock the boat, saw him as an irritation. That meant that his brilliance was never fully celebrated. His fortunes resembled the waves. They went up and down a lot. He needed someone on his side at the top. A Changing Tide In 1804, things started looking up for Cochrane when a fellow Scot, Henry Dundas, the first Viscount Melville, became first Lord of the Admiralty. He wanted things to change too, like Cochrane, and gave him command of a newly built 32-gun frigate, Pellis. Cochrane captured three Spanish merchant ships and a private vessel being used for warfare. In 1808, he took charge of HMS Imperius and raided the coast of France during the Napoleonic Wars. On one raid, he found the code books from a signal station. He copied the books and then replaced them so the French wouldn't know what had happened. This meant when Imperius ran short of water, it could sail into the estuary of the Rhone to refill. While he loved being at sea, he believed the Navy and government would work better with more honest people running things. Ahead of his time Cochrane hated the corruption within the Admiralty and in the government. He campaigned for parliamentary reform and was known for being a radical. This meant he made some very powerful, important enemies along the way. But the public loved him, and he was elected Member of Parliament for Honiton. He just couldn't get on with the other members of the House of Commons, though. It has been said that he ruffled so many feathers that people conspired to dirty his name for good. The best way to do that was to show that Cochrane was just as corrupt as those he pointed his finger at. The Great Stock Exchange Fraud In February 1814, there were rumors that Napoleon had been captured and killed by Cossacks. This news came from someone called Colonel de Borg, who had been seen entering Cochrane's house. News of Napoleon's death sent the stock market soaring as share prices rapidly rose. Cochrane had invested a huge amount of money in government stock and sold it when he thought the price had peaked. When the news broke that Napoleon hadn't died, shares crashed, but Cochrane had already made a fortune. After a dubious trial, he was found guilty, convicted, lost his naval rank, his knighthood, and sent to jail for a year. But Cochrane wasn't any ordinary prisoner. He escaped with the sole purpose of pleading his innocence in Parliament, where he was rearrested and sent back to jail. A South American Liberation Fighter Once released, he left Britain in disgrace for South America. He arrived in Chile and became a citizen in 1818. He hated injustice and wanted to see the people of Chile running their own land. He took command of the Chilean Navy, reorganized them, and helped liberate them from their Spanish colonial masters. Then he took that fleet to Peru and freed them from the Spanish too. But there is a pattern with his behavior. He thought he hadn't been paid enough and left Peru under a cloud. Cochrane then moved on to Brazil to help their fight for independence from Portugal by taking command of the Imperial Brazilian Navy. Sure enough, Brazil became independent and free of Portuguese rule. The new Emperor of Brazil gave Cochrane the title Marquis of Maranhão and a coat of arms. These were extraordinary achievements, and Cochrane should have been thrilled his brilliance was being recognized, but he was always ready to quarrel over pay. When he thought he was being swindled, he ran off with public money, captured a ship, and set sail for Britain, where he arrived in 1825. Later that year, Greece asked him for help in their fight for independence from the Turkish Ottoman Empire, but he wasn't so successful there. He resigned his commission and returned to Britain in 1829. Innocent at last Cochrane couldn't bear to be in Britain and still have the financial scandal haunting him. He campaigned to have his name cleared, which it finally was by William IV. William was known as the Sailor King and was a lot more sympathetic to Cochrane as he fully appreciated his great triumphs of the past and what he stood for. Cochrane joined the Navy again as Rear Admiral of the Fleet. By now it's clear that this was not your average sailor. Cochrane's brain was always working overtime, hoping to solve problems with new inventions. The Stink Vessel 
Cochrane's most controversial invention was the stink vessel. Since 1812, Cochrane had been trying to convince the government to use this invention against the French in the hope that it would shorten the war. The vessel was layered with coke and sulfur, which would let off a choking fog when burnt, but the government couldn't be persuaded. Years later, as war became likely in the Crimea, Cochrane again pushed the idea of his secret invention. When the war began, he included the addition of burning barrels of tar to create a smoke screen. He believed a few hours of this type of attack would achieve what months of regular warfare had failed to do. The Prime Minister, Lord Palmerston, was close to giving the green light when the war came to an end. Cochrane's secret plans of his stink vessel were sealed until 1908 when Lord Palmerston's letters were published. Just a few years later, sulfurous mustard gas was being used in the trenches during the First World War. A True Renaissance Man Cochrane was granted several patents for useful and successful inventions. In 1805, he entered and won a Royal Navy competition to come up with a better lamp to guide ships. In 1818, he patented a tunneling shield with engineer Marc Isambard Brunel, father of Isambard Kingdom Brunel, which was used in building the Thames Tunnel. He was also very excited and enthusiastic about steamships. In 1851, he received a patent for powering the ships with bitumen proving he was so much more than a Navy man. Thomas Cochran, 10th Earl of Dundonald, Marquess of Maranhão in the Empire of Brazil and Admiral of the Fleet, died in 1860. There is a memorial to him in Chile, as well as three statues. Tourists from Brazil and Peru come to see his grave in Westminster Abbey. He lived the life of a hundred people while campaigning for justice in a corrupt world. He was a nobleman who upset the nobility a liberation fighter for the oppressed, a hero ahead of his time. Have you heard of Thomas Cochran? Was he a troublemaker for good or just trouble? Leave your comments below.